Well, we are finishing up uh, 40 Days of Purpose, <clears throat> and I'd like to start the message and end the message with the same way, and that is, what effect has this 40 Days of Purpose had on me? And so I'm going to kind of split this up uh, between uh, five things at the beginning and five things at the end of the message. But both of the, the beginning and the end have a similar theme. And there are two things that really struck me that uh, have stayed with me that, it, that I found using in my personal life. The first is, uh, it's not about me, which is how Rick begins the, it's not about you, uh, how he begins the book. And then in addition to, it's not about me, the second thought was purpose number one, that we exist for God's pleasure. And what has struck me as I've been going through this is that both of these things sort of work in tandem with each other. For example, and I'll give you five things that, uh, that I have that struck me in the last 40 days related to these two particular things. When I start to worry about a particular outcome, whether it's going to happen or not, there are times where I, I catch myself worrying and, and say, Seth, the outcome is not about you. And in this situation that's uncertain, what can I do, Lord, to please you, to bring you pleasure? How can I respond to bring you pleasure? The worry is the first one. The second one is there are times where I find myself going, what happened to my happiness? It seemed like it sort of flew out the, out the window or something. And I will stop and catch myself some and say, uh, Seth, it's not about you. And in the midst of where I am right now, what can I do to bring pleasure to my heavenly father? The third one is that uh, there are times of emotional pain like we all experience and there are times when in the last 40 days I stop and think, Seth, it's not about you. And then the second part is in light of emotional pain that's real, uh, Lord, how can I please you in my response to this? Uh, the fourth one is there are times when I have struggled with some resentment and, um, and I will sometimes catch myself and ask the same question or the same two thoughts. It's not about you. And then the second thing, in light of the situation I find myself in, what can I do to please you in this situation? And the fifth one I'll share is, uh, is sort of the relational pain. Uh, I have uh, three relationships that, are, that have been very important to me over my life that are unresolved. Uh, and, and I really don't know if they'll ever be resolved in my lifetime. And when I think about these either of these three situations, then I think, okay, well, Seth, it's not about you. And then what can I do to bring pleasure to my Heavenly Father in the midst of this uncertainty and sort of this, this feeling, this hunger of wishing that, that these things were resolved? So that's just sort of a personal thing, and I'll end with the other five things uh, that have struck me during the, this 40 days of purpose, but both with the same two sort of... Uh, uh, things that catch your attention. It's not about me and, and purpose number one, what can I do to bring pleasure to God? So this last message in this particular series is sort of a summary of the five purposes that we've looked at and then just sort of a kind of a trying to take a higher picture. What, what are the things that I want to remember uh, from this? Deuteronomy 32 7 says, remember the days of old so now he was talking about like generations past. I'm using this, the days of old, meaning back into January. <laughs> <laughs> Consider the generations long past. Consider the, the six weeks long past. Ask your father and he will tell you, your elders, and they will explain to you. And, and what Moses is telling the folks is, is that there are things that we have to remember. Now, we don't have to learn all the lessons ourselves. The hard way, that's the hard way to live life. We can learn, as, as Moses says here, from generations who've gone before us. We can learn from uh, the people who've, who've lived before us, or we can learn lessons that each of us is learning here. So there are four things that I'd like to talk about today. The first one is, what have we learned about God? And as I've already mentioned, it's all about God. It is not about me. There is a meta story to life that overlays our smaller stories. And our smaller stories we're involved with every day, trying to, trying to do what's right and, and live responsibly and love people and, and reflect the Lord. But in addition, over that, God is telling a story through our life. And the idea here is to try to lift up our eyes to see what is God doing in this meta story using my small story. 
Hebrews 2.10 describes this. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, which is part of the larger story, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, this is purpose number one. These verses, the, this con, these concepts here have to do with purpose number one. That God, for whom and through whom everything exists, including you and me, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. But the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Now, when I think about this, I think about, okay, I exist for God, and God does not exist primarily for me, although he is for me. But that's not the primary thing. And so things like uh, my happiness, there's something more important than my happiness. There's something more important than my comfort. There's something more important than my convenience. There's something more important than how I'm feeling or how I'm doing. There's a meta story that, that's, that's uh, superimposed over this story that, that is meant to be played together simultaneously. I like what Robert Browning, the poet, wrote. Man is not God, but has God's end to serve. A master to obey, a course to take, some things to cast off, some things to become. Grant this. Then man must pass from old to new, from vain to real, from mistake to fact, from what once seemed good to what now proves best. I love this poem because it, it, it entails sort of this, this thing of what is God doing redemptively in my life? And he mentions some of the specific things that God is doing. Second question, what did we learn about life? Uh, life is preparation for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3.11 is one of those sort of like wow verses that you, you try to wrap your head around and it's your, my brain is just not quite big enough to, to encompass this. But he does mention three things here that I think are important for us to remember. Uh, Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. This is part of his redemptive story. In Revelation, at the end of the book, it's, I am making all things new. He is making us new, relationships new. Uh, he's taking the difficulties, the suffering, the, the, the tough things, the hardships that we go through, and redeeming these things. I have made everything, he has made everything beautiful in its time. The second thing, he says, he has also set eternity in the human heart. And that is that whenever somebody is born, they have within them this, this sense that this life is not all there is. That there is something beyond me that I am made for and something for me to enjoy if we will walk with God. And the third thing is yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. Even with the scriptures that we have and the, the amazing revelation that we know about God and about life here, we still have a finite mind and we cannot wrap ourselves to understand all the things that are going on in our life. Sometimes life does not, the, the smallest, our smallest story does not make sense to us. We do not understand, we cannot see. But what we can be assured of is that's part of what life is is there are times when I cannot fathom uh, what God has done from beginning to, to the end. Now, what this tells me is that we are always sort of caught up with the here and now. And in one sense, we have a responsibility with the here and now. But I'm to be caught up with something different. Not the here and now, but eternity in line. What's, hap what's coming? What am I living for eventually? This is the concept of hope. On the inside of your handout, here, here's a review of our five purposes that we've looked at. Number one, I was planned for God's pleasure. And this is the one that struck me the most going through this. The Bible calls this worship, but worship is not just what we do on Sunday morning or singing. Worship really is about who's sitting on the throne of my heart. Whatever or whoever is sitting on the throne of your heart is what you worship whether you know that or not. We all worship something. There's something we're counting on. Uh, secondly, I was formed for God's family. The Bible calls us fellowship. 
And this purpose has to do with God is using the people in my life to form me like Christ. Even the difficult people, the people I wish were not a part of my life sometimes, people that I struggle with, uh, or as Mindy sometimes say, I know God loves them, but I'm struggling. Uh, but there's purpose in there. He is shaping who we are through relationships and fellowship. Number three, I was created to become like Christ. The Bible's word for this is discipleship, or as C.S. Lewis says, he is making little Christs. And this is a, this is a, a thing that starts at conversion and, and goes every day through all of our lives. He is shaping us. Another part of this meta story of who he is making us. The fourth purpose, I was shaped to serve God, the Bible's, Bible word for this is ministry, that we find our significance not in what happens to us, but what happens through us to other people as we serve, use our gifts and talents. And the fifth one, I was made for a mission. Uh, the Bible's word for this is mission or evangelism, which just means good news. Sharing the good news, your testimony, something of what God is doing in your life for the sake of somebody else. These five purposes. Now, I will tell you that going through these five purposes, if you think they're unintuitive, join the club. Nobody thinks of these five purposes on their own. On our own, nobody thinks that any of these things are really a good idea. Nobody's really going to sign up for this, these five things. They are unintuitive to our fallen human nature. God has to almost turn us right side up in order for us to understand something of the meta story, but the meta story involves these particular five things. What these five things do for me is, I'm reminded of uh, when I go to the optometrist about every five years to get an update on my glasses. My glasses are rather, um, I don't know, it's, it's sort of amazing that, that they can do this, but I have three different levels of, of, of prescription in these things, and I don't remember what they're all for, but, but one up, but, but without those, uh, people become fuzzy. I mostly have a hard time reading. Um, but I, sitting in that chair, if you've ever been to the optometrist, they put this big thing in front of you. Okay, now close your left eye and look in your right eye. And they, and they say, Do you, is, does this lens help you more or does this lens help you more? And you pick one or the other. And then they take one out and they go, well, this lens or this lens. And, and every, I don't know, I, every time I do this, it's like, I, I don't think we're really getting what really I need. I, apparently, I have more complicated eyes than most people. And at the end, she will say or he will say, okay, well, here's, here's what we've come to. And I look at those lens and I'm thinking, oh, I don't think that's really... I remember when my eyes used to be great and, and I, I didn't need these. And even with all of this help we've gone through, it's, it's still hard. It's some, sometimes reading um, is a little bit tough for me, even with that kind of help. Now, these five purposes function like a lens for us to help us see life and the particular things that we're going through. What have we learned about growing? There are two things that, I, that I'd like to mention. We grow through making commitments. James 1.22 says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. When I was a kid, my folks went to church almost every week. We went to church, and I remember sitting and soaking. And, uh, and most of the time, I was pretty bored, although I was, for some reason, glad once we got there. I really don't remember why. But... Um, but I really hardly learned anything in my first 18 years of going to church. Sitting and soaking is the slow way to grow. In fact, I don't think I really grew hardly at all. We have to be doers of what we hear if we are going to grow. We have to make commitments. Faith by itself, James 2 says, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. <clears throat> There has to be something that I am doing differently, not just remembering something differently or thinking something differently. <clears throat> For example, uh, in my life, I have some regular uh, appointments with people, um, partly for a mentoring purpose, but also partly for my own growth. I need regular involvement with people if I'm going to grow. 
It's not just going to happen with me and Jesus by myself. That's the slow way to do this. Or uh, sometimes uh, it's helping and serving and uh, jumping in when uh, it's not convenient and what you'd rather do something different. Or for, for us in our church, uh, it, it's one thing to serve on an occasional basis. It's another thing to say, I'd like to serve at least once a month. And thankfully, we have people in our church that do that. And some of them you're not going to see today because they're on that side of the building with little babies and with kids. Um, it's not enough just for us to kind of do whenever it's convenient, whenever it's comfortable. and do that. It, it takes regular commitment. We grow through our commitment and fulfilling commitment. Or... Uh, being committed to lost people that are around you, taking to heart somebody at work and praying for them and trying to engage with them and come alongside of them as a friend. These things just don't happen because I'm just kind of walking through life and, and hope Jesus does something. It takes some element of in, um, initiative and commitment to follow through. We also grow through fellowship. Proverbs 27, 27, in a paraphrase, says, iron sharpens iron so people can improve each other. Um, the, the translation I learned this was, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. We have uh, a bunch of knives in our kitchen uh, that I don't think they've ever been sharpened. And we've been married um, uh, 44 years. <laughs> now, we do have this sharpening tool. I don't know what you call this. It's a handle and a, a rod. And it's got, what would you call these sort of, what? Ridges. what? Like ridges. Yes, yeah. And what you're supposed to do is take your knife and, and, and go against this thing, and it's supposed to sharpen it. Now, about every 10 years or so, I take out a knife, and I try to sharpen. I, I check to see what it was like. And, and, and apparently, I'm not very good at sharpening knives. So we just sort of exist with dull knives, um, particularly. I mean, we have steak knives. I think were given to us, used at our wedding. I'm just saying. <laughs> Bill Gothard, a, a Bible teacher long ago, said, character is formed in the context of binding relationships. Character is formed in the context of binding relationships. Now, children learn this, whether they like it or not, in their family with mom and dad, brother and sister. They learn this at school because you're in the same class with the same 30 people for about nine months. But after we get out of school, uh, who are, where are your binding relationships? Well, it's maybe at work, if you, if you work there for a long time. Then characters being formed in those relationships. If you get married and start a new family and have children, uh, you are going to have binding relationships where your character is going to be developed. Oh, joy. Um, in a church, this is the same thing. Philippians 4, 9, keep on doing the things you've learned and received and heard, and the God of peace will be with you. So Paul writes back to the Philippian church, and he says, you remember the things you saw in my life? The example of my life. Remember those things. Put those things into practice. Do them. Now, in, in my opinion, a church has a secret sauce. And the secret sauce is what I think of as the invisible curriculum. And the invisible curriculum is the example of the people in front of one another. When Mark was up here talking about Kiana Pilsen, you were getting an example of what it's like to be a man who's honoring somebody else and putting words to that. When we were uh, without computer for about five minutes this morning, uh, Lance was, uh, was getting some opportunities for personal growth. <laughs> yeah. But you, you got a, a sermon, in a sense, on how did he handle that? It put a lot of people in our back there, uh, sort of like, what are we doing? Oh, my gosh, how are we going to start again? And the band was kind of like, huh, wow, okay, this is interesting. But, but how you, you saw uh, sort of how do we handle uh, unexpected sort of catastrophes when things were supposed to be moving along smoothly and now they're bumpy. This happens when we have coffee, when we're talking to each other on the, out on the patio or in the foyer or after here. 
There are lessons that our eyes are taking in about what it means to be a husband as you see a husband relating to his wife. Or how a wife talks about her husband to a couple other ladies. Or how parents handle uh, difficult uh, kids when, uh, when they're throwing a fit. There are all kinds of lessons that are happening in front of us if we can see uh, the invisible curriculum. Hebrews 10, 25, we should not stop gathering together with other believers. Instead, we must continue to encourage each other even more. What did we learn about our community? And there are two things that struck me. Uh, one thing is that, that we are hungry for spiritual truth and hungry for community. And how I say that, why I say that is this. It may not feel like you're hungry for spiritual truth or spiritual community. What you may feel just prior to that or instead of that is a sense of loneliness and a sense of emptiness. When you and I feel a sense of emptiness and loneliness, both of those things serve as doors into becoming aware of a deeper hunger in us for spiritual connection with God and with people. Hunger. Hunger is our friend. Hunger is important. Look around you, Jesus said. Vast fields of human souls are ripening all around us. They are ready now for reaping. And the second thing about community is live what you know. Now that you know these things, Jesus says, you'll be blessed if you do them. And here the idea is simply put into practice. Uh, for years, I coached uh, girls soccer, I think 16 or 17 years of girls soccer. And I started out with uh, the little under fives and under sixes. And most of those kids had already learned, unfortunately, that you kick a soccer ball with your toe. And that's the, that's the opposite way of how you're supposed to do this. But just to tell them, no, you don't kick it with, the, with your toe. You kick it with your instep like this, or you turn your toe down and kick it with your laces. Now, these are not intuitive things for five and six-year-olds. They, they, they don't get that. It takes practice. Every practice we had, I had as many parents as I could have take one or two kids with a stationary ball and, and the kid is holding on to mom or dad's shoulder for balance and hitting the ball off the ground, not on the grass, but about mid-ball with their instep. And then they do it with the left foot. And then they do it with, their, uh, with the laces, right foot, laces, left foot. There was never a practice we had in the whole season where we did not spend about five minutes doing that. Why? Because they might know that in their head that this is important to do. But during a game, they're not going to do that. Or practice, they're not going to do that. Unless they practice over and over again and learn the benefits of controlling the ball with either foot, inside or outside, uh, I did baseball. Baseball is intensely about skills. There are so many different skills. One of the things that we would do is we would go to the batting cages. And, uh, and the kids can have all kinds of lessons about, about batting and where to hold the bat and all those things. But there's nothing like having a, a baseball traveling at you uh, faster than, than uh, the, little, the, the other kids are going to throw on the team. And learning how, about timing, about your swing. It takes practice. We did that the whole season, separate from our regular practices. Well, the Christian life is kind of the same thing. You go to a group, and you might, you might be uh, uh, offended by what somebody says. Big deal. This is a, you're practicing. This is practice. You go to your group, and you are practicing learning how to relate to other people and how to respond when they relate to you. There are going to be times when somebody metaphorically kicks the soccer ball with their toe and you get it in an unfortunate place. Um, that's just how life is. Or you're going to be serving. You sign up to serve. And the first few times it goes well and then one of those times it, it doesn't go so well and you think, I didn't sign up for that and, and I'm off the team. Not off the team. This is practice. It takes practice. Over and over and over again. Or sharing your faith with people. This takes lots of practice. You may think, I've tried to do that, Pastor Seth, and I just failed miserably. Join the club. We are, we are all in process of practicing how to do this little 
steps of giving out a potato chip here or a spiritual potato chip here, coming alongside of people, learning to be sensitive to people and looking for opening. All these things take practice. The blessing doesn't come in knowing the purposes of life. The blessing comes in doing the purposes of life. Ephesians 5, live life with a due sense of responsibility, not as those who do not know the meaning of life, but as those who do. And Philippians 3.16, only let us live up to what we have already attained. On the back of your handout, uh, I just want to finish with a couple last little things. Part of the purpose-driven life is it's not about me, it's about God, but it's also about others. It's easy in Christian life to sort of look at myself as a reservoir. And I'm trying to get more spiritual truth in my life. And I listen to a message and I go to a Bible study group and I do my Bible reading at home and sort of take, 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 take it in. And there's places, of course, for that. But, but at some point, the growing slows down if, it, if there's not an outflow of this. And so the Christian life is not like a reservoir. It's really more like a river where there are streams that are coming in that you participate in, like going to church, listening to a message, going to a group, doing your own personal study with the Bible and praying. Those are, those are inlets, uh, tributaries into your river. But then there also needs to be some outgo. And this happens at work or in your Bible study group or here with people or friends or uh, neighbors or people around you. This is what Jesus said in Mark 8. He called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, and here is probably the most unintuitive thing I can imagine saying to our culture. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves. Can you imagine anybody in the secular world said, you know, the, the, way, to, the way to enjoyment is to deny yourself. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a joke that would be out in the secular world. Take up their cross. Meaning there's something in the, in the moment of which I need to die to in order to focus on something higher. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Some translations have that last. will find it. Give my life away to find it. Or seek for my life, lose it. Now, I'm of the generation that when I was in college... Uh, a whole bunch of us, it seemed like every, almost everybody, was trying to convince their parents that we needed to find ourselves after we graduated from college. And apparently the way to do that was to go to Europe for three months on their parents' dime and basically l fulfill every desire you can imagine. And that was the way you're going to find yourself. Now, that is exactly the opposite way to find yourself. That is, that is the road towards emptiness and loneliness. And I, I can speak with some experience with this because I had my own version of this the beginning of my junior year where I had my trip to Europe, but it was locally at the university. And I had all the things that I would have done in Europe available to me. In the, and, and where it led me to was a growing sense of emptiness and loneliness. This is so unintuitive to us. It is a paradox that we find our life by giving it away. We lose our life by hanging on to it and trying to, what can I get out of this kind of mentality? What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his father's glory and the holy angels. Romans 1.8 says, says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for every one of you because the news of your faith is spreading throughout the whole world. What Paul heard about the Roman church was they were not sitting and soaking. They were engaged with their culture and people around them. And because of that, news was spreading. The good news was spreading. And this word got back to Paul. And he was saying to them, that's how it's supposed to be. You're on the right track. Now, in your handout, uh, I have the five purposes again, except it's a little bit more personal. And this is just kind of a time for you to think. I'd like to just give you a, a short, brief time to think about these five purposes. 
I've told you that for me, personally, purpose number one is the one that has grabbed me the most uh, during this last 40 days of purpose. What I'd like to do, what I'd hope to do, is that you would identify with one of these the most as well, whatever that happens to be. So here they are. Number one, I was planned for God's pleasure. And the question is, how can I please God today? Or for me, when I am jolted out of, in, into some situation, what does it mean to please you in my response to this? That's purpose number one. The second one is I was formed for God's family. How can I be a blessing today? That's our shorthand for help me to, help, help me to get outside of me, help, help me to be a first, first you, then me kind of person. The third purpose. I was created to become like Christ. I will use this day to make choices to grow my character. So when I'm faced with temptation usually or wanting to take the easy way, um, what, what's the right thing to do here? What's the responsible thing to do? What, what is, what is a, how should a godly man think about this situation? What should a godly man do in this situation? And then seek to do that. That's purpose number three. Number four, I was shaped to serve God. How can I serve God or someone else today? And so in your, in your daily life, your antenna's out, hopefully. Is there something I can do when I'm at work? Is there something I can do when I'm out at lunch? Something to do with my neighbors. Something to do with somebody in my family. Uh, fifth, I was made for a mission. Is there something of my testimony I can share with someone today? Uh, Lord, is there somebody that I need to be, I need to have a little bit more courage with, or take a little more initiative with, or ask some more questions? <clears throat> well, I'll, I'll finish uh, again with just some personal reflections. Uh, five other things that struck me, but they were around these two core ideas. It's not about me, and what can I do to please God through this particular situation? And there are uh, five others that struck me. Um, I found myself dealing with some jealousy uh, during 40 days uh, when I was um, sort of um, not considered for something, uh, overlooked. And, um, and during, that during this time, I was like, okay, well, it's not about you. How can I honor God? How can I bring pleasure to God when, um, when it feels like I'm being overlooked? Uh, the next one that struck me was... Um, Times when uh, I, I deal with insecurity quite a bit. And um, so w when, I, when I feel insecure um, about an outcome of something, um, okay, well, this is not about me. Uh, what can I do to please you today in the midst of this situation? Another one was I found myself being impatient uh, quite often. And uh, when that catches my attention, okay, Seth, this is not about you. What can I do to please you today, given this particular situation, or to please you now? What does it mean to please you now, given this situation of impatience? Uh, the ninth one is uh, there are times when I feel guilty over my failure or weaknesses longer than the confession of sin and forgiveness. That, that should be it. That should take about 10 seconds. But there are some times where I sort of get on the guilt train going this way, and I can ride that guilt train for several days. Um, and during that time, it's like, oh, wait a minute. This is not about you. It's not about your pride, not about getting it right. God, what does it mean to honor you or please you in the midst of my weakness, weaknesses or failures? And the last one I'll mention was uh, there are times when, when I'm just stubbornly holding on to something that I think I need. And it's not happening. And I keep holding on to something that's stubbornly that it's not happening. And so there are times during those last 40 days where I stop and think, okay, Seth, this is not about you. Okay, God, given this situation, what can I do? What does it mean to please you with this situation? So what I hope is that in these five purposes, that there's one that has struck you the most. Or it might be that some of the different points like it's not about you was the one was a really big one for me and then purpose number one all right well let's pray together oh one other thing we have some more of these uh, uh, and this is sort of the summary of the uh, the purposes uh, they're out there on the table you can get these 
Uh, you might want to hang them on uh, your refrigerator or desk or something that you'll see uh, more than just uh, next by, by the end of this week. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that you have busted through our human nature that is proud and stubborn and already knows what to do and doesn't need any kind of divine wisdom and doesn't need any kind of divine power and I have what it takes and just all that malarkey to humble us and to bring us to a place where you can turn us right side up and that we can live for very different purposes than just our own pleasure and desires, our own comfort and convenience uh, and, and, and just for the moment wanting to feel better. Thank you that you've given us lenses to be able to see life. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and for the Bible that gives us these lenses to be able to interpret life and what's happening to us better than just by our own shoddy eyesight. Maybe as you've been going through this, you've wondered, I don't, you know, Seth, I don't even know if I'm a Christian. All of these things just seem so unintuitive to me. Uh, and maybe that's, maybe that's the case. Maybe you've thought yourself a Christian or considered yourself one or assumed you were. I, I remember doing that for a long time. Maybe this is the moment where you say to Jesus Christ, I see that I am a sinner. It's self first and how I want to feel first and what I want first and what I need first. All of these things define and illustrate the problem of sin. And thank you that Jesus Christ came to die for such people as us who are self first people. Thank you for the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Simply call out to God and say, God, I know that I'm a sinner and need a savior. And that's just who God provided. And yield yourself to him. Lord Jesus, begin the process of making me the person that you want me to be that I've heard about during these 40 days of purpose. Get me on this road. And when I stray off this road, bring me back on this road. Again and again and again and again. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.